Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the New York IMAP Invasives monthly webinar. Uh, today's webinar is user stories from 2020. So we'll be hearing from some of IMAP, what I like to call super users. So we have Anna Stopson, a postdoctoral researcher from the Yale School of the Environment, Emily Teal, the Education and Outreach Program Manager from the Western New York PRISM, and Dr. Mary Beth Kolishvari, an Associate Professor, professor of Environmental Studies and Environmental Sciences at Siena College. And you'll also hear from me. I am Mitchell O'Neill, the End User Support Specialist for the Invasive Species Database Program at NYNHP. And if so those are our introductions, and you can introduce yourself in the chat box using the, the prompts I listed. So your name, um, either your organization or the town you're calling in from. And if you are an IMAP user, how do you primarily use IMAP? So do you report data? Do you view data? So I work for the New York Natural Heritage Program. Uh, we have a new, uh, newly live website at nynhp.org. I encourage you to check us out and see the diverse work that goes on in our program from rare species conservation to invasive species work. And I work in the Invasive Species Database Program where we administer IMAP invasives for New York. And we also uh, work with the Watercraft Inspection Steward Program and creating spatial prioritization models to help prioritize management. And so our agenda today is, first I'll go over a, some brief 2020 highlights for IMAP and bases, and then we will hear presentations from our three super users, and then there will be a discussion. And so the goal of this webinar is to, um, as we're moving in, into 2021, moving towards the field season, um, look back at 2020, and highlight some of the interesting ways that people have been leveraging IMAP and BASIS with the overall goal, goal of being to share ideas and promote some advanced ways to leverage IMAP and BASIS in 2021. And so with that, I'll give some brief highlights for IMAP and BASIS in 2020. So IMAP and BASIS is used by several jurisdictions across North America. In New York State, we use it as the Centralized Invasive Species Database to support PRISM, so Partnerships for Regional Invasive Species Management, and we'll hear from a PRISM staff member uh, later today, uh, state agencies and other partners working on invasive species issues. And so with IMAP Invasives, you can use species distributions, users can generate reports for summaries of the data, um, you can Sign up for early detection alerts. Our data are available through web map services, and the platform allows for tracking control efforts and results. And the first highlight from 2020 is that NatureServe added some new functionalities to the IMAP Invasives platform. So there's now a more streamlined confirming workflow so that our network of experts and volunteers across the state are better able to review records coming in and verify species identity. We added, or NatureServe added uh, the functionality for distribution maps. So you can view invasive species distribution by the geographic layers we have, like counties and hydro basins. A new geographic layer was added, municipal boundaries. In New York, that's towns and cities. Uh, reports were added, so users can use the export report tool to get uh, data summaries. And finally, uh, a new data entry method was created, the IMAP Invasive Survey123 form, which allows for some more advanced data entry beyond the pre-existing mobile app. And I wanted to show this chart that shows um, how data entry has evolved over the years for IMAP invasives. So the main trends to see are that in the beginning, um, bulk upload was the dominant data entry method. Um, so that was when, towards the beginning of the database, uh, 
we had pre-existing data sets for invasive species in New York that were imported into the database. Um, and then in more recent years, it's become uh, more common for data to be entered directly into the database. So one of the other trends you might see is uh, this green bar, this dark green bar getting larger progressively. Um, so the IMAP mobile app has been gaining more traction and we've been getting more records submitted each year. And that's used by national resource professionals as well as community scientists and the general public. And one last thing to note for 2020 is the increased use of NYNHP advanced field data collection tools. And I'll talk uh, about those uh, for a second or so in a slide or two. And so thank you to everyone who submitted data in 2020. We got thousands of records. Um, the most common species, uh, these are the, the treatment records. So these are the most commonly treated species in IMAP, just to show you that uh, treatment records are also submitted to IMAP invasives. And so these are the advanced field data collection tools that I wanted to mention. So these um, got a lot more use in 2020, and we're very happy about that. Thank you for everyone who made use of these advanced tools. Um, so these are for if you're doing advanced survey work and you need to use uh, functionalities like making polygons, uh, recording treatment. Um, some tools have additional fields for specific survey efforts like uh, aquatic surveys and forest pest data collection. And if you want to learn more about that, you can go to this link here, myimapinvasive.org slash report and invasive, or you can click on the report and invasive tab in the main menu. Another important feature in IMAP invasive in 2020 were the email alerts. Just to tell one story, um, over the summer, an IMAP user submitted a hemlock willy adelgid presence near Lake George using the mobile app, and email, email alerts were triggered. So key partners across the state had set up email alerts for hemlock willy adelgid. So they were notified promptly, and they were able to organize a subsequent on the ground follow up action. I also wanted to uh, note the trainings for IMAP invasives in New York for 2020 as another highlight. So obviously there's a huge shift to virtual trainings. Um, and overall we had 57 IMAP in tra invasive trainings were delivered by MINHB staff and certified trainers to over 1,000 people. And so the certified trainers network consists of PRISM staff, nonprofit staff, educators, citizen scientists, we had a few um, new volunteers this year, including volunteers rather than professionals. Emily Thiel, who you'll be hearing from, Emily Thiel, who you'll be hearing from later, uh, is one of the members of this network and conducted several trainings this year. So I just want to thank everyone who helped us uh, promote IMAP and bases and uh, deliver trainings to the general public and other audiences across the state to help get more eyes on the ground. And the last thing I wanted to highlight was the sixth annual IMAP Invasive Challenge, or the sixth annual Invasive Species Mapping Challenge is the full name. Uh, we got hundreds of records submitted for these four key species that were selected. Um, so thank you to everyone who participated in this effort. We had lots of records from uh, professionals, as well as new IMAP users, volunteers, community scientists. Um, to pull one story out from this, um, we had one user who was a new user to IMAP um, and got excited about the mapping challenge, submitted a lot of records, particularly for jumping worms, and they ended up winning for jumping worm. Um, so they submitted the most record and won the challenge for jumping worm. And in particular, one record that they submitted um, was the first record submitted in Montgomery County. And so these records get a special flag that they are first in the county, meaning that they're an important data point uh, that kind of improves our understanding of the invasive species distribution. Um, and so she submitted this picture. Um, there's a pen for scale, and the picture was high quality and clear enough that one of our experts was able to confirm it. 
Um, and that expert is actually Anna Stopson, who you'll hear from soon. And so I just wanted to thank uh, everyone who participated in this challenge. And so those were the brief 2020 highlights. So now we can move into the presentations from IMAP super users. Um, and we'll start with Dr. Anna Stopson, a postdoctoral researcher for the Yale School of the Environment. Great. I remember that picture. That was a great picture. <laughs> Worms are sometimes hard to capture. <laughs> um, all right. So, um, as Mitch mentioned, I work with um, invasive jumping worms, and that's the common name that we give to um, a whole number of species. But in, in our region in New York, it's predominantly Amenthus agrestis, Amenthus tokyoensis, and Metafire hilgendorfi. Um, and so I joined up to be a, um expert idea, uh, thinking it was sort of a favor that I was going to do, um, but it became pretty quickly apparent that I was going to get more out of it than I was putting in. <laughs> um, so I do, uh, I do get the, the IDs to confirm. Um, I get those emails sent to me. And, uh, but one of the ways that I use this information is that it's, um, there's georeferenced natural history anecdotes. So in the comments section, people often add little tidbits here and there. Um, and this helps my understanding of uh, um, the natural history of the species. So, for example, I had heard so there's supposed to be annual species in our region. Um, that's what you always hear. But once in a while, people would mention, I think I've seen them all year round. Uh, but because they're georeferenced, kind of see that those are sort of centered around the coast um, and around sort of Long Island, New York City area. Um, up through the coast towards towards Boston. And so just these little anecdotes that you get when you can't be on the ground in all of these places, um, they are really, uh, really, really helpful to me to build the hypotheses that I work on um, and things like that. Um, another thing that's really good is that I get the email notification so I can get in ahead of the invasion front. And this is really important. If you look at this map here, all of that dark gray uh, at sort of the bottom 75% of the map, that's all regions that jumping worms could move into uh, based on their thermal tolerance. But if you can see, they really haven't progressed up into Canada very much. And so when they pop up close to uh, the Canada border, we can sort of work with those um, agencies over in Canada to warn them that this is close and this is coming. Um, and so that's been really, really helpful. Next slide. And I just love that this is this is in real time. So anytime I give a talk in some area in Connecticut or New York or even um, you know Ontario near the border, I can go into IMAP and I can pull up the sort of regional distribution of jumping worms so that people can see um, where it is in their region, so they have a sense for it, and it's not just a generic talk. Um, it's really integrated with the Prism network. So when these new reports come up, I can get in touch with the um, people working with the prism in that region and in the Slilo prism, um, I was working with Megan and we put together a, a sort of a instructional talk for people in that region where the jumping worms are just starting to pop up. Um, and I think that that was really effective. Um, and what's great about it is it's a direct pipeline of information from the community, from the people on the ground to researchers. So if there's not I don't have to just sit in my ivory tower. Uh, I actually get the information straight from everyone um, that's observing the worms. And one thing that came from it, from one of the IMAP mapping challenge uh, videos is that a reporter who works, um, a reporter wrote a story about jumping worms and it ended up in the Atlantic and was really, really widely read throughout North America and throughout the world. So uh, lots of things that you don't expect will come through IMAP. Next slide. I also use this to facilitate collaborations. With invasive species, it's really hard to study them just in your own little area. You need to work at kind of a large scale. And so we have this jumping worm, J-worm working group um, that's facilitated by New York Invasive Species Research Institute. 
And we've been able to start a whole bunch of projects throughout the Northeast region, looking at IMAP data to find our treatments that we want. So invaded, jumping room invaded, um, and uninvaded sites. And especially during COVID when you can't just travel around so easily, it's been totally invaluable to set this up. And we've been able to work, you know, multi-state, um, and it's been really, really a great tool for us. Um, what's gr speaking of which, I'm not the most organized person, and so having this repository of georeferenced organized location data uh, just has been phenomenally helpful to me. Next slide. And we are putting together some uh, some research projects based on this. So this is a collaboration with Tim McKay and some of his students at Colgate, um, looking at the distribution of jumping worms and some um, of people's relationship with them. So this is a, a sort of citizen and community science project that I collaborated with them entirely remotely this year during COVID. Um, it was student-driven research, so undergraduates that um, designed the experiment, ran it, and led the writing of the paper. And what's great is we've been collaborating with different um, primarily undergraduate institutions throughout the region, so state schools, private schools, um, even some high schools and things like that. And so I'll just point you to the map first on the right. Um, where we have the published range, sort of generally in gray, uh, but then the citizen science or community science data points, which are predominantly IMAP invasive points, uh, filling in some of those missing places that researchers had just never even looked at for the presence of jumping worms. And we can use this information that's pretty detailed in New York, um, not so detailed in other states, but based on the sort of habitat and um, climatic conditions, extrapolate out where jumping worms might be in sort of the whole region. Next slide. Uh, and just, just a couple little excerpts from, from the paper was that New York State actually had 10 times more community science data points than any other state. And that's not just because there's more people or that New York is bigger. Um, it was an order of magnitude bigger, even when you account for that. Um, and this is probably not because New York is more invaded than other states nearby. Um, I think I think that probably you know IMAP and the prisons and the whole structure of working with invasive species in the region has just made it really um, really obvious in people's minds, and people are thinking about it. And in New York State, IMAP was. Um, by far the most common place that people are putting in their values for jumping worms. And just in this, um, in this last figure I have here, you can see that most of this has just been in the last four years. And I think that the IMAP mapping challenge started three or four years ago or something like that. So correlative, but kind of interesting to see these reviews going up. I think that's all I've got. I think we're going to do questions at the end. Um, if you're willing, we were going to do some questions right after. If oh yeah, that's there right. Are any. <laughs> yeah. And I can, I you can also put any. them into the chat box. Yes, I don't see any questions in the chat box now. Um, I'll give a, a minute or so if anyone has any questions about anything Anna has presented. You could enter those into the chat box. That would be great. All right, looks like there aren't any questions at this time, but please enter them as they come up. Um, and thank you so much, Anis. That was a really interesting presentation, and we can also address questions about it at the end. Um, but for now, we can move on to the next section, which is uh, Emily Thiel, the Education and Outreach Pro Program Manager for the Western New York PRISM. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks, Mitch. Um, so yeah, um, I am Emily Thiel. I am I work for Western New York Prism, doing specifically all of their education and outreach kind of stuff. Um, our mission in the Prism Network, if you're not familiar with it, our overarching goal is to prevent and minimize the harm caused by invasive species to New York's environment, economy, and human health. 
our region specifically, we work in the eight westernmost counties of New York State, which you can see on the map here. And since everything that we do involves invasive species work at some level, we use IMAP invasives a lot. And we use it across all of our care programs. We use it for our terrestrial invasive species uh, management and surveys. We use it for our early detection work. We use it for our aquatic invasive species aquatic invasive species programs, including our watercraft inspection program, and a species in education and outreach. So just to kind of illustrate how much we use IMAP, I'm going to throw a couple numbers at you. If you don't be expected to remember them, there's not going to be a quiz at the end. But in our region, we have over 34,000 total observations. Uh, in 2020 alone, we added 4,800 of those observations. And then Western Europe Prism, we use IMAP for all of our survey work. We do use some of those advanced survey um, options that Mitch was talking about previously. I think we use IMAP Mobile Advanced, but we may also use Survey 123. Brittany, I, I see you in the audience, so feel free to correct me. Um, so we, we, Western Europe Prism, personally, we do create a lot of observations. Uh, we did 3,500 observations in 2020. Um, but while we do generate a lot of observations, we also have a lot of organizations that we partner with that create observations, like DEC and New York State Parks. Uh, but it's also really important, as Ennis was talking about, to recognize our citizen or community science scientists out there that are using these tools to add observations and add to this really important database. So, like Rich was saying, I am a certified trainer, and in 2020, we uh, welcomed 160 new IMAP users to this group, and we're really excited to grow this number even more this year. Uh, so with that, we will get into some of my favorite IMAP stories from the Western Europe region in 2020. Next. So since IMAP is such an adaptable tool, we use it for a lot of different types of work. The one I work most closely with is volunteer training. So as I mentioned, we trained 160 IMAP volunteers. And probably my favorite training was a hemlock woolly adelgid training that we coordinated with some of our partners at the New York State Hemlock Initiative. We also worked with Erie County Parks and Cornell Cooperative, Cornell Cooperative Extension of Erie County, all really great partners that we work with all the time. So in Western New York, we still have relatively low rates of hemlock woolly adelgid. So it's really important to get people out there and find new infestations as soon as possible so that we can manage them and prevent their further spread. So working with these partners, we organized a training for February 15th of last year. And this event was actually so popular, we had to turn people away and hold a second event in early March, just before everything happened. Um, but that was really exciting because we've never had the type of community engagement where we've had to not only hold an event and close people out of it, but hold a second event just because there were so many people interested in it. So that was really exciting. Um, but anyway, we had a pretty large group at this training at Chestnut Ridge Park. This is a very popular park just outside of Buffalo. And we taught them not only how to identify some of the Belges, but of course, how to report their findings to IMAP invasives, both absent and uh, detected and not detected uh, observations. So we set up survey plots in the park and had interested volunteers sign up specifically to survey those areas. And as you probably already put together based on the spoilers I put in the slide, we had a trained volunteer report the first uh, reported finding of hemlock woolly delgid at Chestnut Ridge, and I think the second or third report of it in Erie County the very next day. So it was really exciting to see the work that we did had an almost immediate effect. Um, and that was definitely aided by the volunteers use of the IMAP app that we trained them on just the day before. Uh, so we are going to build on this work. We're going to conduct additional surveys with volunteers this year, and our partners at Erie County Parks will be treating this infestation. So the, there is a happy, happy ending to this story. It's nice validating and kind of wraps up nicely. Uh, next slide, please. So the use of INAP is also really important for our early detection work. And as I mentioned previously, any early detection work that Western Europe Prism staff complete, we automatically add to the INAP invasive database. Um, but as Mitch kind of alluded to earlier, we're just a really small organization. Our staff alone can't complete really in-depth surveys of our entire region. 
So we really rely on the eyes of our partners and those of our community scientists to be out there and looking for invasive species for us and with us. A lot of times we'll get reports of new invasive species that have already gotten pretty large, pretty large infestations. Um, you, people kind of need that really large infestation to trigger the question of something is not quite right here. Uh, but ideally we want reports of early protection species that are just a couple of plants, a really isolated area. So this uh, example I have here is a really textbook look at what we would love all early protection work to look like. So we have a really passionate community scientist in our area who really made it his goal to survey for invasive species in Delaware Park. Uh, this is a, a small city park right within the city of Buffalo. And we are so fortunate that he did because he not only reported the first infestation of porcelain berry in Erie County, but it's actually the first report of porcelain berry in our region. So having a community scientist find a very small infestation and then reporting it both to INAP invasives and then separately to us, he didn't even have to do that. He like went the extra mile. Um, but of course, having that information reported to INAP made it really easy for us to look at the images that we're taking, this can be sometimes a tricky species to identify just because it looks so much like great signs. Uh, but we also really had really easy access to the precise location of this finding. And so like I like with the previous stories, this one also has a nice happy ending. It was a small isolated infestation. It was manually removed and our invasive species management crew will be out in the area this year and in sub subsequent years to make sure that we've found the only population and are hopefully able to eradicate it. And next. All right, uh, so these last two examples are built off of IMAPS, or the previous two examples were built off of IMAPS presence and absence observation points. But as Mitch mentioned, they also have the option to report treatment data. And we made really good use of this this summer with an infestation of water lettuce we found in Hyde Park Lake, again, just north of Buffalo. Everything kind of bubbles up right around city center. Uh, but normally when we find water lettuce in our region, it's a couple of plants here and there that we create an observation point for and come back the following year to survey for and follow up with. This infestation was a little bit different just because it involved hundreds of plants. So once we got a report of the initial infestation, we mapped it. We had one of our survey technicians visit several times over the summer. And each time he did so, it created a management record. So by having the original observation data, as well as each management record submitted through IMAP, it made it easy for our staff to communicate about where the infestation was, how extensive it was, how many plants there were, if any of the plants were hiding um, so that they knew to come back for it in a different place and really search that specific area next time. Um, but then as you can see on the timeline on the right, at, by the end of the summer, we've removed over 700 plants from this single lake, but it's really just a large pond. So 700 plants is so many, uh, and it really helped make the case that this, this species water lettuce isn't just a threat down south in Florida, it also has the potential to impact Western New York. And like all of our early detection work, we are going to be revisiting the site for at least the next five years to make sure we can eradicate it from the area and just stay on top of it and make sure nothing else comes back. So these are just a few of the ways that Western New York Prism uses IMAP invasive. We also use the email alerts. We also make reports all the time. But these are just some of the really gratifying, satisfying stories that came out of 2020. Uh, so with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I don't see any in the chat, but if anyone wants to chime in, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks so much, Emily. That was great. Really good to hear all the cool ways you're using IMF and bases at the Western New York Prism. Um, I'll give another couple of seconds to see if any questions come into the chat. And you can also um, enter questions in even once we move on to the next section and uh, we could either answer this in the chat or address them at the end. Um, I'm still not seeing anything in the chat. So I think for now, I'll thank Emily for presenting and then move on to our third and final presenter today, uh, Dr. Mary Beth Koloshvari, Associate Professor of Environmental Studies and Environmental Sciences at Siena College.
Thank you. <clears throat> so I teach uh, upper level undergraduate courses in invasive species and conservation biology at Siena College, which is a primarily undergraduate institution just outside of Albany, New York. It's located in Loudonville. And I've been using IMAP invasives in, uh, since, 19, uh, since 2015 in both my uh, teaching and my research and community projects. How I incorporate uh, IMAP invasives into my courses, I, students are generally trained in IMAP invasives, so they get user accounts, they learn how to use that. Uh, and also, obviously, uh, I think it's obvious, uh, they would learn what, you know, learn about what invasive species are and why there are in such an important issue affecting all of us. Another uh, thing that I introduce the students to is the regional uh, partnerships for partnerships for regional invasive species management that is in New York State. So they understand about how this network works in New York State and how the partnership structure works um, that's taken to address invasive species in New York State. So they kind of learn that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And I also introduced in the lower right uh, you can see the invasion curve, and that's another very important part of the, of the, the uh, lesson plans um, so that they can understand and put into perspective the importance of prioritizing efforts. So I'm sure you're all probably aware of the invasion curve, but it just indicates from the far left, um, you know, around the X is time, time since invasion. And on the Y axis, you have the amount of area that's infested by a particular invasive species, and also the, um, the, the cost to controlling or eradicating. And so it really puts it into perspective about, you know, where do you put, you know, we don't have, I was just actually just teaching my conservation biology class uh, about another aspect. And we're, again, trying, they're trying to wrestle with, uh, why can't we just, you know, restore everything? And it's just not really um, practical and reasonable, we don't have unlimited funds. So it really puts it in, into perspective, you know, how can you best um, minimize the, the spread of invasive species or maybe even prevent them from moving into natural areas. So these times, you know, these before they get to an area or when you, when uh, the last speaker was just talking about some examples where they were early detection, they're able to, to get those species um, if they're high, you know, potentially highly invasive, those are going to be the ones that they that you want to um, prioritize instead of the ones that are well established that you're never going to be able to get rid of um, through mechanical means and things. So, uh, training the the students in an, uh, an IMAP invasives, giving them that background. I also all of my students have smartphones, so it's uh, the IMAP uh, mobile app is accessible to them, so they all. Uh, load them onto their uh, onto their smartphones, and we go out and they learn out in the field how to identify invasive species. They learn how to use the uh, the mobile app, and then we'll do surveys, maybe on the campus or other um, close by natural areas where they're out doing surveys and uploading observations to IMAP invasive. So they get that kind of experience. Sometimes during my classes, I might have an opportunity. So, for example, a few years ago, uh, there had been uh, a new infestation of hemlock woolly adelgid at a nearby uh, natural area, and it hadn't been found in the area before that. So, my students went out and we went and we did surveys to see the extent of that. Had the hemlock woolly adelgid moved population where it had been very small and local, had it potentially moved to other stands of hemlock in that natural area. So we went out and did those early detection surveys. So, you know, depending on the potential opportunity, there's lots of ways to incorporate it, that I've incorporated it into my classes. As well as doing, oh, and I've, I've got this one picture um, of me and a student uh, that's part of an undergraduate research project. I've also, uh, in terms of my own research and research uh, working with undergraduates, I've uh, participated in a number of uh, invasive species research projects um, in collaboration with the IMAP Invasives team and through the Ecological Researches Education Network, both through a garlic mustard project and the jumping worms. And uh, thanks for Annis for bringing that up. Um, I see that some of our, uh, which the project is led by Tim McKay, who 
um, has also been working with Annis, and I can see where some of the contributions that um, a colleague of mine in Plattsburgh, and then that my students also um, uh, contributed to those data that um, have gone into IMAP invasives and have had a much wider impact in terms of the, the research, for example, that Annis is doing. In the in-class uh, activities, we also work with uh, the, I, uh, the IMAP invasives on, on desktops where students will work in, typically we'll have them uh, working with and logging into IMAP invasives and uh, working in teams and they'll learn, they'll learn to uh, query through the IMAP invasives. They're assigned a county, so they work in teams assigned a county and they'll go through the different data layers uh, in terms of observations, what species are there. They also are introduced to the tier list, the regional tier list, tier one, two, three, and four species. So they have an idea of which species are potentially the most important ones to, to potentially focus their efforts on. They also review other data layers like natural resources in the area, um, et cetera, just to get some ideas of what types of resources are, are out there in the county. And then they are led through uh, uh, an exercise where they develop um, priorities. They're, giving, they're given uh, an amount of funding, uh, a fictitious amount of funding, and then they have to determine, uh, come up with a proposed project that they're gonna do with that money. Where, is there, where, are, there, where are they gonna uh, concentrate their efforts with this limited fund? And they have to provide justifications. And then at the end of the class, uh, everybody, all the teams share which projects uh, they're proposing and their justification why. And then we sometimes we voted on who ends up getting the funding. Uh, so next slide. I'm also uh, in our curriculum, uh, I'm the internship coordinator in our department. As part of their, uh, the degrees uh, in environmental studies and sciences, they are required to complete an internship in their field. And I'm, the role that I have is depending on the student's interests and skills, um, I reach out to potential uh, internship sponsors. Uh, depending on their needs and their capacity at the time, I have matched up several students with, um, that have ended up working with IMAP uh, invasives, um, pr um, primarily uh, the capital region PRISM, our local PRISM, as well as the IMAP Invasives team. And we're kind of lucky because we've got, we're just outside of Albany, so they're able to interact with um, the IMAP Invasives team as well. And as well as the students getting experience, even more experience with uh, invasive species and the day-to-day -day operations of working with an agency or organization that's working with invasive species, they also typically have one or more projects that they are working on as part of that internship. And so, for example, some of the cases, there was a, a newly acquired natural area uh, in, uh, from the local land trust. And so one of our interns went out and they wanted to get some, uh, the PRISM wanted to get a little bit more information on distribution of some of the invasive species on that property. So the student went out and did mapping and prepared a map and recommendations. Uh, the, we've also had um, several students working on different, preparing different training materials, educational materials, educational videos. Um, so they learn a lot during that process. And I've just got some pictures here on one of the intern, internships that I'm gonna talk a little bit more about. Uh, this is an intern that was working uh, on a Japanese knotweed project in the area. And this is a collaboration between some academic researchers and the IMAP Invasives team. And it was a pilot project and it was uh, designed to try to uh, see if they could use Google Street View to identify locations of Japanese knotweed and could they use through these machine-based learning techniques, uh, would they be able to help use that in order to identify potential um, locations of Japanese knotweed? In the lower left, this is an area that it was the target area. It is uh, close, uh, it encompasses uh, areas surrounding the Albany Pine Bush Preserve. 
This is a very important area. It's a globally rare inland pine barrens system. So it's definitely, it's got very many, very unique species, unique community. Uh, so it's high, highly important um, from an environmental perspective. And it's also in a critical environmental area at, it designated as a critical environmental area for the town. So this is the area that they focused on. And in the lower, um, on, on the lower images, one of the images is showing um, how it works. Um, you've got, uh, what is it, a bounding box. Um, the instruct, uh, uh, somebody goes through the images and, and when they detect uh, Japanese knotweed, these are basically training images. They put a bounding box on there. And then um, on the far right shows an example of, and then the computer is programmed to go out and try to, to run the images through there and to detect potential locations of uh, the Japanese knotweed. And so as part of that project, uh, the intern also went out and did surveys. So actually went out into the field and looked for locations of Japanese knotweed. So by combining both the information from the pilot project as well as uh, on-site surveys, um, they were able to, I think, I've got the numbers here. Uh, before this project was done, there were only eight known locations of Japanese knotweed along roadsides. And after they completed the uh, surveys, they found 37 new Japanese knotweed observations in the study area. So it was very important. Um, a lot more information was provided on a species that can be um, very invasive. Uh, next slide. And the uh, last thing I want to mention is how I've incorporated and used IMAP invasives with local community partnerships. And in particular, uh, the Town of Colony Conservation Advisory Council. So Santa College is located in the Town of Colony. The Town Hall is directly across the street from Santa College. And uh, the Town of Colony Conservation Advisory Council is very active and engaged. And so we ended up getting connected to each other um, through the IMAP Invasives team and the Capital Region Prism. Um, so we kind of got connected and introduced to each other. And for the past several years, I have had students that have surveyed natural areas. So they've done um, surveys, uh, both aquatic and terrestrial, uh, along corridors of potential corridors of invasion on natural areas within the town. They were also trained on, and I'll emphasize that they were trained on identifying tier one and tier two species on the surveys. They recorded all the invasive species that they saw along the way, but they were trained particularly on tier one and two species because those are the species that they would want to bring to the attention so that we could, um, you know, potentially uh, either eliminate them or reduce their spread. And we also, based on all that information that we found in the natural areas within the town, we were able to use that information to, to identify key natural areas. So we, ha we found a few sites, either the whole site or a large portion of the site that ha had, uh, you know, one observation of invasive species. So these were very special, uh, unique areas. And so now that is on uh, the list of um, sites to do early detection surveys for the capital region prism. So it's not necessarily they'll go out every year, but now that they know and they recognize these are, you know, largely uninvaded areas, and these will kind of go into the, um, the little cycle of uh, doing these early detection surveys. So that provided very important information there. And uh, the students also provided, uh, have developed outreach materials for the town. Uh, and we've also, every year, we've uh, led an invasive species walk at one of the local areas uh, and have gotten really great attendance at that. So we've identified uh, two natural areas that are very important for public outreach. Um, they get a lot of high traffic, um, a great place for a boot brush station or other ed educational signage, or for example, um, this invasive species outreach education. Um, walk. So that's it. Thanks so much, Mary Beth. That was great. Um, I see one question in the chat box, so I'll pull that up. 
Um, so this is actually from another professor who has a history of leveraging IMAP and bases, uh, Dr. Vogler, and she asks, is your course training part of a course segment or is it run as a standalone course on invasive species? So I have a standalone course on invasive species. And I also have, when I do the conservation biology class, it's just a, a, a portion of it. Thank you. And with that, I'll thank Mary Beth for her great talk on how she's been using IMAP Invasives, a lot of cool ideas for professors and educators and researchers as well, um, and people who engage communities. And so now I think uh, you can continue to put questions in the chat that you have for any of our three panelists. But I think I'll move on to the discussion for now. Hey, Mitch, just one quick yep. thing to add to the mix, because uh, I know some of Mary Beth's students have done this, and I know Emily mentioned it. If anyone on the call is interested in the IMAP Certified Trainers Network, um, that has been something a lot of the college students have done, because then they can put it on their resume that they're an IMAP Certified Trainer. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there might also be, um, there are a couple of new people on the call. Um, and, uh, you know, if people are looking for a custom webinar for their group, um, you can reach out to Mitch and he can try to match you with an IMAP certified trainer that would be appropriate. Yes, thank you for adding that. So now we can move on to the discussion. So I have a couple of discussion prompts to try to get thoughts moving. I'll start with one idea that I have for a functionality that I think would be useful for going into the 2021 field season. Uh, we have a report called the Approaching Region Report. And so you can pick your area, whether that's um, a specific conservation area, maybe you work at the county level, and you can pick a radius and have the report tell you what species are found within that radius, but not found within your selected area. So that'll give you a list of the species that, uh, maybe they're species that are approaching, maybe they're species that are just underreported, but it gives you a good list of species that you should put high on your list to look out for as you go out in the field again in 2021. Um, so I think that's a, a new thing that could be very useful for the upcoming season that I, I encourage people to look into. Um, hi, this is Brittany Hernan. Um, I just wanted to say I really enjoyed using IMAP Mobile Advance this year. It just made the work so much easier. You know, we used to take polygons on a GPS and then sit at the computer and put them in and our, you know, seasonals were great. They would try to match it up to that hill or that bump in the stream, you know, something like that. But it's just so much nicer not to have to take those those indoor data entry days and just take your polygons, your polylines, not detected, everything all at once has really saved that data entry time. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for sharing. That's great to hear. And if anyone else is interested in learning more about that, that's the uh, IMAP Mobile Advanced. We also call it IMA. It's a field data collection tool through the collector app by Esri. Um, and you can learn. Uh, some more about the functionalities that it has on um, at our website at myimapinvasive.org slash report and invasive. Um, it'll go through the different functionalities. Um, one thing to note about that one is that it is more, you need to have some GIS experience and then uh, organizational ArcGIS online account. So if that applies to you and you're interested in learning more about it, I encourage you to look into it more. And with that, I think I'll wrap up. So a huge thank you to Emily, Mary Beth, and Annis for all of your really interesting presentations. And even more so, thank you for all of the, the interesting ways that you've been utilizing um, IMAP Invasive. With that, I wish everyone a good day. And I hope to see you next month at our next monthly webinar.